Welcome to Past Medical History, a series brought to you by the BJCA in partnership with Wonder Medical. Through these conversations with the people who have shaped modern cardiology, we hope to inspire you with their stories and perspectives on landmark events. I'm Nikhil Alawalia, and today I'm honoured to be joined by Professor Sir Magdi Yacoub. Professor Yacoub is Professor of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Imperial College London. It's difficult for me to summarise the impact of his, on the specialty that he's had. His peers and colleagues have described a surgical technique and compared it to that of Leonardo da Vinci. And the adoration of his patients is clear to see all across London and on the internet. He's pioneered novel techniques and has really established cardiac surgery here in the UK with a case, with a case record of over 2,500 cases at Harefield Hospital. He continues to have tremendous impact through his namesake organisations across the world and improves access to cardiac care globally through his charity, Chain of Hope. So with all that going on, Professor Yaku, I'm so grateful that you managed to take the time to join me today. Thank you. Great. And so um, as a trainee, I want to start by taking you back to your training days. When you came to the UK um, in the 1960s, you worked with some of the biggest names in cardiac surgery. You worked with Lord Brock, and Donald Ross, and aside from the surgical techniques and skills you learned, what else did you take away from those experiences about being a doctor? Um, maybe may I take you back slightly longer? Uh, as a little boy, I was inspired my, by my dad, who was uh, a doctor. And uh, as a four-year-old said, I want to be a doctor. Then something happened. Uh, and that his younger sister, uh, whom he adored, uh, died of rheumatic heart disease, mitral stenosis, at the age of 20. And he, during childbirth, people marry very early there, and uh, he just couldn't recover from this. He fell apart. To which that little boy, insignificant me, said, I am going to be a heart surgeon. So he looked at me and said, listen, you, you haven't got it in you to be a heart surgeon. And I said, why that? And he said, um, first, you're disorganized. I am. I admit to that. Two, you haven't got the intellect. I objected to that not very loudly at that time. And uh, they took me to a psychiatrist because I was a very quiet little boy. Sat in the back of the class, said nothing. And they said, well, he's mentally defective for sure. So I said, please, I don't have anything to say. Why do you want me to talk? I don't have anything to say. To cut a long story short, um, I came uh, every year top of the class. They said, well, th this mentally defective boy, he must be cheating. And, and, but that happened every year. So I jumped the class. And uh, my brother was in the same, and we became, he was older than me, and we became like, uh, had a bond together and studied together, came to the fellowship together. And then uh, I always wanted to be a heart surgeon. And my dad too said, oh, they are starting to open heart, uh, valves. And he mentioned the name Brock. I will go and work, work with him. I said, just quiet. And I said, just don't talk rubbish. So uh, time goes on. And I come to this country, finish my f fellowships, and quiet. I'd, one thing happened was that uh, in Egypt, with all uh, the uh, awards I had in, the, in that school and scholarships and this, I thought I was the best. I came to this country, and then I realized that I was bottom. And that was very good for me, for course, because Throughout the years, now if you ask me, I hope you do, but I can volunteer, 
what is the secret of success? I don't, I don't know what success is because it is something defined by you or somebody else. It has to be defined by myself. And to me, it is three things. And now I call them PPH. What is PPH? Everybody used the acronym, so why not? Uh, the first is passion. I really do have a passion for my work. Uh, the second is persistence. I'm not ultra bri bright, but I'm persistent. I'm not going to let go where I, wa I want to go. And the third and most important to my way of thinking is humility. Uh, both intellectual humility, but also humility. I know who I am. I'm a humble uh, person who came from, okay, a low middle class family. So I never forget that. I'm not it. I'm just a humble person trying to do his job, which he has a passion for. Now, your question, sorry for uh, being verbose. It's not a good thing to be verbose. Uh, is, uh, uh, when I came and worked with, so, so it didn't happen suddenly. I went to the London chest. I loved the London chest. Why? Because it was in the East End. And guess what? I really enjoyed Victoria Park and Bethnal Green because I identified with the East Enders. They were really lovely people, down to earth, beautiful. Victoria Park was beautiful. And then I came to the Brompton, which was the great Brompton Hospital, um, and worked for Brock eventually. But in the meantime, I had, I worked for other people. Matt Panath, I don't know whether you know him or not, or know of him. Uh, Oz Tubbs, who worked at Bart's, and um, uh, who else, apart from Brock, yeah, another person who had a profound effect on me, apart from Brock, of course, uh, was Norman Barrett, of the Barrett Alsa. I think he came from New Zealand, but he was a brilliant man. Sorry to start, by because that was the same era and they were, they were all at the Brompton, and I was the senior registrar at that time. I enjoyed my time tremendously because I would come to Brock at the end because uh, Panath was full of life and just typified energy, young energy. And uh, as for Ostops, we called them Ostops, uh, Mr. Tubbs, he was a great gentleman and a perfectionist of the first degree. That's what I learned. I said, oh my God. We used to scrub if we, I'm, I'm the senior registrar. So if Mr. Tubbs Oz is scrubbing, we're going to scrub with him. You have to wear uh, stockings against varicose veins because it will take eight hours. But his patients did brilliantly. Why? Because everything had to be perfect. If he does a lobectomy, you're familiar with that, of course. Uh, he dissects the interlobar veins. You have to see them at the tree. Other surgeon tear it apart and say, take the bronchus, and let us go. Let's go where Tubbs will not do that. And uh, a perfect gentleman, of course. I, I remember vividly uh, one of the registrars uh, just simply said, uh, give me a swamp nurse, because there was a bleeding. And he said, what? You shouted at this lady. And he said, said I, didn't, I didn't mean it. He said, you shouted at a lady, and I request you to leave the table. Get out of the open. Sir, I'm so please let that be a lesson. You do not raise your voice 
during surgery. That taught me a lot, of course. I don't hardly speak during surgery. I listen to music. But that was tubs for you. And he adored patients as well. We had also to learn that. And as for Norman Barrett, he was the editor of Thorax at that time. But he was brilliant. In what way? He comes and asks um, unusual questions, like what? He called me Jakes. Hey, Jakes. Hi, sir. And Jakes, I, he always asks a question, and you have to be prepared to answer that. Where is the subphrenic space? I said, excuse me, sir. He said, is it? Uh, between the two layers of peritoneum? Is it between the peritoneum and the diaphragm? Or is it between the peritoneum and the liver? And they say, um, I don't know, sir. To which he says, well done, Jakes. I don't know either. He was the, the king of gastroesophagus and the uh, I don't know either. And you know why I was asking you? Because I didn't know, and I have to give a lecture. So I'm hoping that you, get, you give me an intelligent answer, but you prove to be just as ignorant as I am. That's another lesson in humility, which I do believe now, and I teach all my trainees, please be humble, because you're not going to discover anything if you're arrogant. You think you've got to to the pinnacle of something, and you poop, look up, it's very high, and you're not there. And Karl Popper says exactly the same. I didn't know Karl Popper in those days. But uh, there were uh, lessons to be learned from people like uh, Mr. Norman Barrett. I just thought we adored him. We just had to wait for him to arrive and say, my God, what question is he going to ask now? It had to be very unusual, very intellectual. And he also taught us um, that when you write a, um, an article for Thorax, please make it short. You know why I say that? Because if you have something to say, then you can say it in few words. If you don't have something to say, you review the whole literature and come up with nothing. So, and I said, like what? And he said, like uh, Collis fracture. Do you know who Collis is? I said, no, sir, I don't. I'm, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, but I heard the word Collis and uh, fracture. And he said, uh, Mr. Collis was an Irishman. And he wrote in The Lancet a short article on Collis Fracture. He described everything in great detail. According to Mr. Barrett, it was half a page. Since then, of course, there are books written about Collis Fracture. And according to Mr. Barrett, they haven't said anything more. He said it all. In the original article in the Lancet. So that taught me the second lesson or the third lesson, I don't know which, uh, brevity and clarity, or clarity and brevity. And uh, one of the editors of the Lancet uh, spelled that out very, very beautifully. And he said again, it is always you have to be clear and you have to be brief. And he said a uh, uh, previous editor of The Lancet used to pray every night and say, God, give me clarity and brevity. Amen. <laughs> Three words. Yeah. He said it all. So I learned from these great guys. Come to Brock now. He was a tornado. He really was very, very active. And we used to prepare everything all night to know everything about the patient. 
but he was still. And we looked at it. Why are you, why are you? Uh, use the, the, the English language properly. Uh, you have to be specific. So somebody says, uh, this patient in general needs surgery. He said, oh my God. You mean this p the surgery is the art and practice of a specialty. You, mean, you meant an operation. You have to be specific. Okay, sir. And you say in general, you mean specifically. And you talk about the patient disrespectfully as well. You are an idiot or something. Sorry, sir. And so, and so it goes on. So he was adamant that we should use the correct language. And we were very frightened when he would come, the cars, the Rolls Royce comes, and we're looking from the window and say, oh my God, we, so we, we line up for the ward round. And uh, sure enough, he would find something to upset him and like. We showed him in the notes. And the great Paul Wood, my God, when we do, I haven't met him because he died just before he was, uh, where was he, at the National Heart and the Middlesex. So Paul Wood sending a patient. And we showed him what's written. It's uh, Wood. Uh, he was Mr. Brock then, or Sir Russell, Sir Russell. Would Sir Russell uh, perform a mitral vervotomy on this patient, severe mitral stenosis? Oh my God. Sir Russell tore the notes and threw them on the floor. Sir, what happened? He said, did you see what he wrote? I said, what did he write? I, he just asking you very politely, sir, to consider mitral vervotomy. No, he should uh, write, would Mr. Brock or Sir Russell see this patient and advise about his management? These are two different things. Okay, sir. Yeah, they are two different things. Uh, okay. Uh, what does me? What? Uh, wh why are you upset? He said, "Look, you guys, looking at me out the scenery, right? You have to be a better cardiologist than the cardiologists themselves." Why? And he said, and that taught me another lesson. Because when you are at the operating table, nobody's going to help you for sure. You are like fighting a battle alone. And the, the example he gave, uh, you don't know who, what's going to meet. Either a, pol a London policeman on a bicycle, very tame, or a German army coming at you, then you have to be high. So you have to be prepared. How do you get prepared? You must understand the pathology and break it down to its component part. So he, to, he was an incredible mind. So he learned, you asked about uh, Lord Brock. Uh, then, he, what did he also say? Uh, a lot of, a lot of things about, uh, yeah, they, he would come in the morning and open heart surgery was starting and forgive me, but he wasn't the best of surgeons, not like Bright, uh, uh, Tubbs, who was very meticulous or bad with it. And he starts shouting at all of us. And that, but he starts the operator. I adore the man, you can understand, of course, uh, but nobody's perfect. He would start the operation by saying, this is a difficult and dangerous operation. And it proves to be difficult blood all over the place. We're running from one area to other. He's shouting at the anesthetist and at the perfumist. And it is mayhem. And you hear him in the corridor when he is operating. It's a disaster. And difficult 
And what happens? Patient dies at 10 p.m. We started at 7.30. We're all exhausted with a dead patient. So he's sitting, lamenting there. He goes out. He himself wrote uh, an incredible article in uh, one of the Canadian magazines saying the life of a heart surgeon, lamenting uh, losing patients. And he was a very sensitive man, but he wouldn't show it, of course. He was a macho man. Uh, so he comes back and say, Yakub, he say, yes, sir. What happened to the outpatient? Well, the outpatient was at 12 o'clock. I said, uh, what outpatient, sir? Outpatient was at 2 o'clock or 12 o'clock. And I said, um, I didn't know at that point whether to laugh or cry, probably cry. Uh, but he would say, um, Listen, you would do anything to get out of this outpatient. I know you. I said, sorry, sir. He said, okay, don't do it again. I won't. But he just turned, taught us whole, not in surgery, apropos this is a difficult and dangerous operation, that taught me one thing, that it's a state of mind. So every operation, I start with my team, now even, after learning from Sir, from Lord Brock, I start by saying, this is an easy and safe operation, guys. Let's start. And I don't want anybody to talk in there. Let's listen to J.S. Bach. Quieten down, no excitement, no shouting, no talk. So lessons learned, huh? in a big way. So yeah. that was Lord Brock. L lots of things that I want to pick up on then. And I just want to now go back to your father. After you have achieved what you've achieved in your career, did you at any point revisit that conversation with him where he said you shouldn't no. be? No, no, he was very proud. But uh, it died just before I uh, went to Chicago, for example. But he show me, saw me being uh, a consultant cardiac surgeon, and he was full of it, of course, saying, almost I told you so, but he didn't. <laughs> okay. um, fine, so now w I want to dig more onto your principles, this passion, persistence, and humility. How did you come up with that? Was that something right from the beginning, or is this something you learned as you went through? Uh, thank you for that question. Actually, passion, I always had the passion. You could understand that I never veered. I loved what I am doing. And uh, many times people said, hey, you, you'll never make it for a variety of reasons, including some of my mentors. I won't mention names. Very uh, well-known cardiac surgeon, cardiothoracic. He said to me, you are clever, however, Tell me why, what the how. Uh, we have repaired all the repairable heart defects. There's nothing left. My advice to you, get out of cardiac surgery. But I love cardiac surgery. And he said, well, you're, you're going to be dead professionally, uh, I predict. I advised you, get out. But I, I, I always had the passion for, that's a bit about passion. And uh, uh, another example which upsets me is that in medical school uh, in Cairo in particular, uh, I, I was educated in Cairo. At that time there was experimental and so on, but now the vast number. So I met a, a new graduate and I said, now that you graduated as in what is um, by far uh, the noblest, the best profession in the world. What do you want to do? The world is in front of you. He said, oh, only two things. I was, what is that? And he said, to be rich and famous. I said, oh my God, these are rubbishy things. You must get your values right. And once you get your values right, because you must spend a whole lot of time as a growing child, and what, what are the values? 
what's important in life. Once you define that, then the second half of your life uh, is pure joy because you're trying to achieve your, your own values, not determined by you or anybody else, or your, even your dad or anybody else. So that is the passion bit. What was your question, sir? No, yeah, well, when did you come up with this? Was it throughout your training? From, from, from early on, early because on, okay. uh, as a resident in Cairo University, I loved what I was doing. I loved the two things, uh, uh, which are patience and science, which that arti articulated that later in life, as you say. But at that time, I spent all night, day after day, uh, performing e ECGs on the whole world, trying to understand and show it to the consultant in the morning. So I had passion for for the profession, and also had passion for the patients. I saw uh, kids, and I remember them almost like yesterday, and go in the middle of the night in pulmonary edema, short of breath, aortic regurgitation, can't do a thing. So I sit next to that boy, which is six year old or seven year, I'm going to die. And they said, no, 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 come on, let's keep talking or something. And they give him a, an injection. That's all what we had, or aminophilin. Thank you, I feel better. All that just upset me. And that is why I got the old, my, the values are looking after patients and science, and where are the patients? 80% of them are in the, that will come later, of course, uh, the uh, middle and low income countries which need to be served. What are you learning all this for? So that is the passion bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so you, you've, whenever I speak to anyone about you, or I hear stories, they talk about your commitment and this persistence to the specialty and you work till late at night and then back in the hospital again early in the morning. And at any point during this day after day, did you ever experience burnout? Uh, no. Uh, the only, uh, I'm 86, 87 now. Uh, I still am excited by seeing patients getting better or uh, by teaching young people to do new operations. I work with them, I scrub just to help them and admire what they're doing. I give them all what I have in terms of knowledge and both theory and practice. And that's a delight to me. I'm not burnt out. I will go on until I chum. <laughs> 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 okay, and then with, within the work that you do, there's a lot of talk about needing 10,000 hours of procedural skill to become a master of it. And of course, with the 2,500 heart transplantations and thousands of other surgeries you've done, you've reached that clinical uh, sort of capacity. But how did you then find time and how did you decide to do other things like your passion for research and the leadership positions you took in this work internationally? How did you know that you could reduce the number of surgeries you were doing to do these other things without compromising your skills? Um, I didn't reduce the number of surgeries when I was practicing. And now, I, because I used to go late at night, as you said, I could catnap on a trolley in the OR or go at home and sleep two hours or one hour or not at all. But I would be reading the latest and issues of nature. That came later when I was appointed a professor. I wanted to know everything about basic science. So I read nature science and all uh, journals. And em I employed a, lo a lot of young people in my department. 70% uh, of them were basic science. And the people said, this is ridiculous. What are they, what are you doing? You're trying to put yourself out of a job because if you discover the basic mechanisms and all what you talk about, 
you, you will not be needed. I said, that will be the happiest day in my life. I'll go and grow oranges. I love growing things. So I, uh, uh, finding the basic mechanisms and applying science, now you call it translational research. Yeah, so good, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> but at that time, that wasn't part of the story at all. Why? And you have physicians, scientists. People realize that, like 20, 30 years later, that you need, and it is to say, at least in those days, if you discover the basic mechanisms, uh, you can apply preventive me measures. I remember on a trip to Jamaica with the Chain of Hope, um, we used to, uh, in the campus there, beautiful campus, uh, meet up with people from the MRC, uh, from the UK. And they used to say to us, you're parasites, what are you doing here? What's needed is preventive measures. I used to get very cross with that. You need to know more about the heart, and you can't do that tertiary surgery and this and that. We supply you with problems, uh, we, you get answers. And uh, besides, there are many people in the river already. And they said, oh, uh, stop people jumping in the river. Oh, yeah? Show me how you get pe stopping people jumping in the river. And even if you succeed in doing that, there are already thousands, maybe millions, already in the river. Do you leave them drown? They said, oh, God, I mean, you're talking nonsense. Okay, I'm talking nonsense. So what, what are we talking about now? This is... Uh, so I, I guess the idea of research and whether you think a surgeon should be doing that to improve their quality of their clinical work. Yeah, that's number one, of yeah. course, to improve the quality of their number. But they also must discover basic mechanisms of why things happen. So that improves their surgery and reduces the numbers by applying preventive, that's why I was talking about the preventive and that we are parasites. We're not parasites. We're trying to stop because the number of patients is overwhelming, needing surgery. Surgery, as uh, Lord Brock used to say, is the science and practice of performing operations. Okay, but it's now a specialty which is needed in the community. So, but it is badly needed to the extent that you can be overwhelmed. And you have one surgeon for several million people in Africa or somewhere, a disaster. So you need to reduce that size to deal with it because there are things you cannot right now anyway uh, prevent like transposition of the great arteries, truncus arteriosus, they are born with one artery. You have to do it in the first week of life, or well, first year, you should say, uh, and so on. So it is a specialty which is needed, but you must reduce um, the number, and like you said, quite rightly, enhance the quality of what don't say, I know it all, that's the bit about humility. I don't know it all. And the other thing is what, what keeps me going now is the fact that I, w I work with young people. They are 20s and 30s uh, being trained. And they are lovely. They keep me young because they come up with a lot of what you m it might sound a silly idea, but it's great. So we are always c together if they come up with something really ridiculous, I tell them I've seen it or not. I give them the experience. They give me the youth and not being frightened of anything. Let's go. Yeah. So that's being with young people is a great attribute. And yeah, not disillusioned by the system and still have that passion. Yeah. Yeah, great. So um, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about heart transplantation. And I know that back in... Uh, 1980, there was a moratorium against doing transplantation in the UK.
Can you tell me a bit about what the general consensus was about that and why you thought this was still something worth pursuing? Uh, that's an excellent question. At that time, I was a senior registrar or maybe even appointed a consultant at the National Heart uh, Hospital. And uh, we saw a lot of patients, tertiary referral center, with a terminal heart failure, with nothing would work. The heart is damaged structurally, functionally. No, no way you can do anything to repair it. Or, and we said, my God, the kidney transplanters are getting away with kidney transplant. Why don't we transplant the heart? That was uh, before Barnard, and uh, both Donald Longmore was experimenting in the lab and putting heart and lung, and we, people were laughing at him because he was a surgeon, but he was running the pump and the physiology, and I loved the guy. And then he went on and into MRI, fantastic. He was always futuristic, ahead of his time and he was beaten. But before Barnard, we were um, at the National Heart, before the famous first in this country, uh, thinking hmm, one day somehow we should be transplanting heart because of the need. Yeah. There was a pressing need and there was the precedent of Roy Khan. You will know of, of Roy Khan. No? Oh, excuse me. Uh, Roy Khan actually uh, was a contemporary or trained with, uh, with Donald, Donald Ross. And Roy uh, was very bright. And he became uh, the professor of surgery at Cambridge University. And he was transplanting kidneys galore. He went to Boston and learned immunosuppression and kidney transplantation, uh, what started the brain death and all that. So we thought, why don't we learn from Roy? Roy eventually got uh, cyclosporin A as well. He was experimenting with a whole lot of immunosuppression. And in those, in those days were only steroids and cytotoxic drugs. But we getting really, and if you see the results we did of uh, kidney transplantation, it transforms the patient. You say dialysis, but we didn't have a dialysis. We didn't have an artificial heart. We didn't have an LVAD or anything. So these patients were doomed. But we saw the kidney, how patients are transformed after a kidney transplant. Uh, and later on, when, we, when I was in the program doing thing with kidney and liver failure, and uh, they say do the heart and everything corrects. Actually, we did the kidney first and everything else corrected. It's amazing. So transplantation is a fantastic thing. But what your question is, how was it, how the population uh, met that idea? They were very hostile. The newspapers said it's experimental surgery, and they're doing it for their own glory. Maybe there was a bit of that, but I don't think so. I mean, we, s we came from the patient's need. There was an unmet need, but they just went story, oh, you're uh, um, against God, against death, against death, you're controversial doctors, you are awful. They attacked us like hell. I, uh, later on that is, when we, I was still, no, no, I was in Chicago and I uh, was the lowest of the low uh, staff on the university, instructor, assistant professor, that's the bottom, uh, because you have no tenure, your instructor and assistant professor. I enjoyed it. I was working with students and this and that. And more than that, who comes to lecture? 
but the great Sir Peter Meadowell. You know who he is? Yeah, yeah. heard of him. Huh? Yeah, yeah, surgeon. Uh, no, no, Sir Peter, uh, the Nobel Prize uh, laureate, Nobel laureate, uh, who uh, was a professor of biology at UCL and then at Oxford, but professor of uh, philosophy as well. And he had the most profound effect on my life because I was reading his books, very humorous books, Memoirs of a Thinking Cabbage, Pluto's Republic. Pluto, that's people of the intellectual underworld. Amazing man. He was a very tall, handsome guy, came to lecture about tolerance because he wrote in 1954 the paper which made tissue transplantation possible. Do you know that paper? Very simply, induction of specific immune tolerance, 1954. Uh, and uh, he put his juniors ahead of him in the paper in Nature. That won him the poor because you induce tolerance to tissues. He could f put kidney, f kidney, heart, skin, and from one, f it's still allogenic in a mouse. But that opened the, the doors for transplantation. He came to lecture, everybody adored Sir Peter. And I got to see him there, there listen to him. When I came back, I went to, had lunch with him because he was so humble. I was nobody, totally nobody, and interested in transplantation, and said, Sir Peter, uh, can I come and see you, sir? Oh, my dear chap, come and have lunch with me tomorrow. Oh, my God. Uh, so I used to go and have lunch with him and discuss things. Now here, if you uh, want to know about him, uh, why is he called Medawa? Medawa is a Lebanese name, Medawa means round. And in his biography, Memoirs of a Thinking Cabbage, he talks about we, the Venetians, always learned to go take to the sea. So my, my dad took to the sea, sailed towards Rio de Janeiro, stopped in the UK because we were, everybody was sailing in those days. Uh, and married the daughter of uh, the, the, the lady where he stayed in, the, in their house. And that's my mother. He took her and went to Rio de Janeiro where he did his own thing. But they sent me uh, to be educated in the UK. So you can't get mixed up than that. Uh, mother English, father Lebanese, born in uh, in Lebanon. Uh, no, he wasn't born in Lebanon. He was born in Rio de Janeiro, educated at Oxford. He said, this is just uh, chaos. But out of all this chaos came somebody like me, and I have to be humble. Yeah. So that's what Peter Meadow. Great. Okay, so that was the journey through transplantation. And then now I want to find out a bit about your stoicism, which is when you have had very, very, very good surgical outcomes, and I think partly because of the volume that, of, of cases that you did, but you said that there is no such thing as a zero complication surgery or zero risk surgery. And so when things don't go your way and you have a difficult case that doesn't go well, how do you recover to then go back to the operating table a couple of hours later and operate again? Yeah, um, I, I deal with that. And during surgery, um, I am almost automatic. But so I, and, but uh, also adaptable. While I work out what I'm going to do and so on. Uh, but I don't think 
of this baby, uh, that beautiful child I saw the night before. I detach emotions from that, and I, uh, if that baby dies, uh, I am not emotionless. I go out and I'm really sad, and I go and see the parents. Now I learned it later even more, that you, the parents need you more than anything, so you go and say, I am very sad, almost as sad as you parents because we have lost this lovely child. Tell them why and how uh, we lost him. I go to my team and say, how, how do we deal with this disaster? Uh, I think it was Dabrok or Panat who said, hey, if you don't w want your hands burnt, don't go into the kitchen. If we get into the kitchen, so our hands are going to be burnt. But what do we do out of this mess? Uh, is it human error? Sometimes it is. And Marc de Laval was the greatest guy who championed the idea of human error. So we say, okay, how are we going to prevent this happening without blameology? I don't say it's your fault, it's my fault. It could be. I have to, being the, uh, the senior person, have to take the blame because why did it allow it? Don't say that a, a junior person actually made a mistake. So we say, okay, no blaming. What we want to know, that is the answer to one question. How do we prevent it from happening? And what we do admit human error, and which can be corrected, or a whole lot of things like the Swiss cheese thing, you know the Swiss uh, cheese? Yeah. That so many holes and a bullet goes through. So we have to make sure that we stop this happening again. So that's how we deal with it. In the meantime, I feel very sorry about the family and the beautiful child, which I, whom I have met before and looked so beautiful. Brock, in spite of uh, the macho picture he gave. I uh, wrote uh, an article, like I said, in a Canadian German. Uh, they asked him to talk about the life of a heart surgeon, and that's what he talked about. It's all lamenting about uh, the pain of losing patients and of failure, of uh, that he would wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, I don't like you. Who are you going to kill today? Can you imagine the agony of a man like Brock uh, waking up in the morning and lamenting? He pours his heart as a very sensitive human being rather than the fighting character which he felt he be as a leader and as a teacher. And he used to say things like, yeah, I have to teach you how, how not to do things. I make, I'll make all the mistakes so you guys don't do it later. So he was a great man, yeah. the Greek, an incredible brain. It goes back to what you said about humility, yeah. which, um, I mean, from an external person who doesn't do surgery, I find that, you know, very refreshing that it seems like that humility is so important to being a good surgeon, to be able to look and learn and take back feedback rather than think you know everything. Absolutely, and I had that adopted that attitude before I read Karl Popper. You know Karl Popper? Yeah. The philosopher who has of science had the biggest impact uh, on uh, our thinking in the 20th century. And Popper says, um, in a b whole book called uh, Conjectures and Refutation. And he said that science Im improves in steps and it has to be driven by conjecture theories. And we make a massive mistake, and that is when we make that theory, we want to prove it. Actually, we want to refute it. And that's hence the title of the book, Conjectures and Refutation. And 
if we can refute it, then we shouldn't be doing it. We're nearer the truth, because the absolute truth is unachievable. We keep on going, like we said, the, moment, the humility thing. And so if we can refute it, that's good. We're moving towards the, the top. If we can't, can't, we're still moving to the top. He said, however, we don't do that. We try to prove it. But who comes to the rescue? Our peers. When you send it to a journal, they send 20 <laughs> refutation. We get cross. We shouldn't be cross. They're trying to push us towards uh, the truth. Who knows, knew all about that? The ancient Egyptians. My grandparents, ancient, because they had Mat, the goddess of the truth. She's the most most beautiful creature, so the the truth is beautiful. Okay, but if you come near Mat, she grows massive wings, and flies away. So you can't. The truth is unachievable, and that is gives the humility. Uh, how did I know about it even uh, before I read? Papa, uh, because I was asked, I was in favor of the arterial switch operation. Uh, Adib Jatin and uh, us here did it almost simultaneously. We became, although there was competition, of course, it's called the Jatin operation, no problem. I became very, very good friends, a sensitive, lovely man, actually Lebanese, living in Rio de Janeiro and became the Minister of Health. But what is, why the refutation thing? I was asked, because I was favoring the arterial switch operation and done cases and this and that, by the editor of the General of Thoracic Surgery at that time, Dwight Magoon, another incredible man, to write an editorial, Why Switch? And so I actually declared my bias in the title, The Case for Anatomic Correction of the Transposition of the Great Artery. But then I put 10 reasons why it shouldn't work and said, unless all these 10 things are uh, satisfied and uh, issued, um, it will not succeed. Then I had French colleagues ringing me, what the hell are you doing? You're writing 10 reasons why it shouldn't succeed, and you're talking against yourself. I said, I'm not. I declared my bias, and guess what? Now I gave a lecture called Challenging Dogma. The arterial switch operation is not what it seems to be, and many of the 10 reasons are haunting us today. So you must look at refute your theory, if you like, and not, I know it all, the macho thing. Yeah. Uh, humility, intellectual, and in dealing with people, I just would befriend anybody. And indeed, in Aswan, uh, we have, we treat everybody equally, regardless of color, religion, creed, or money. We don't take a penny. And all human beings are equal to us, and we treat them. Uh, but I could befriend uh, the cleaner guy. Because it's a wonderful human being, and he has skills, he has everything. So I could talk to anybody. I am uh, uh, the humility. Is, is essential in life, dealing with people, but also, more so, in science. Yeah, yeah fine. And so, um, looking at everything you've achieved clinically, was there anything that you think you wish you'd done additionally or differently, looking back at your clinical career? Uh, no, I would do it again, but uh, what remains to be discovered is huge. And uh, I want to conquer two things. Do you know what they are? Stem uh, cells? Uh, stem cells? Uh, no, actually, stem cells are coming bottom of the line. Okay. <laughs> um, regenerative medicine. Yeah. 
uh, tissue engineering, uh, heart failure, reversing heart failure okay. of the devoter, because seeing people with uh, irreversible heart failure, it's not irreversible, it can go back to this uh, reverse remodeling and all that, so I do a lot of that research. Tissue engineering, uh, I'm learning a lot. That's what occupies me now, and I'm going back to Herfi, because we want to send the paper to Nature, where we start with ECM, extracellularometric, actually not f from biological sources, but synthetic, I ask you, and it actually attracts the right type of cell, houses it, and instructs it. And you get all types of cells because actually I'm following uh, Donald Ross's dogma of a, a living valve is essential for two things, longevity, you, you live longer. And that's being proven now, the Ross operation causes people to live because you need a living valve which has very sophisticated functions which affects everything else and importantly which we all care about quality of life so that's what's occupying all my mind now. What, what did you think of the pig heart transplant in uh, America recently? I think it's a big b b uh, breakthrough I have to admit uh, I am on the scientific advisory board of the company which produced uh, the peg. And when they uh, made it, the, the press release, they mentioned my name. Even though I was uh, the person, they say he's our mentor, and he's the conductor of the orchestra. I'm not a mentor, and I'm not a conductor of orchestra, but they are generous to put it, the Americans do. Uh, because I kept um, warning while I'm on the scientific advisory board. I said, yes, we should do it. But there are so many pitfalls ahead of us, including the fact that there is PERV, big integrated retrovirus, which could wipe out humanity. Look what's happening now. So if you, that all has been dissected out, and they said, you taught us a loss to be careful and get rid of a whole lot of things and make sure that we don't get hyperacute rejection. If you put a pig in a baboon or a primate or a human, if you dare, it rejects within seconds hyperacute rejection. That has been partially conquered. To answer your question, uh, it's a massive breakthrough. And I said, Again, although they put my name in the press release that I'm their mentor and they called me also the conductor of orchestra, I have no orchestra and I'm not conducting. I'm just warning and saying where are the pitfalls. Uh, it is a breakthrough, but many people say, when, are, when can we have it? You can't have it. A, it costs millions and millions of dollars, pounds, and nothing has been totally worked out. But remember the science improving in jumps, and I was trying to refute it, exactly what Papa said. This is a massive jump, but it's not going to be available to the public in the next two years. Nonsense. But it has to be recognized as a massive uh, breakthrough. Norman Shumway, who is credited by doing a lot for transplantation, and he has in Palo Alto in California, used to say, I, I do criticize him at times, so forgive me, I don't like to criticize people, but he said, genotransplantation is around the corner and will always be around the corner. <laughs> So he didn't believe in it. He said it will never come. Yeah. Now it came. It's one breakthrough, but remember the refutations.
Yeah, okay. And I mean, you've done so much and there's still so much to do. Have you ever thought about what legacy you want to leave yourself or what you want to have remembered? I leave, I want to leave um, a, a biggest, the biggest number of young people carrying on all, all what I have learned. So I'm desperate to give them all what I have. And they are already running with it uh, to present it to science and humanity, the two masters I've always had. Humanity first, then science, the truth. So that is what I want. Great. OK. And then you, you, I don't think there's anyone who's been involved in cardiac surgery for as, as long as you. And over that period, how do you think cardiac surgery, but also the training, how has it changed in that time? Good and bad, mm. like anything else. The good, it's become routine. Because when I arrived at Harefield, they were doing uh, one so pump, open heart, every one or two weeks. And I said, no way, we're going to do 10 a week next week. I said, the guy's mad get rid of him. And I was humble at that time, and I still am. And so I said, I said, they we're going to displace all the surgeons. I said, no way. I'm going to serve all the other surgeons. I'm the most junior boy. Literally, that's what I said. I come and assist you. I come and clean the floor. I can run the pump. I can scrub with you, sir, or whatever. And then they said, just carry on then. But at the beginning, he said, he is mad, he's stretching everything, and he's taking over all the glory. I said, I don't want any glory. I'm the little boy, the, the, the youngest and the, the new, the, the boy who can help in any way I can. So now cardiac surgery is a routine. It is a great weapon to fight illness. It is needed in the community. It is what Lord Brock said. It is the science and practice of a lovely specialty. It is a specialty. It's obviously merged with cardiology and cardiac science is becoming one. And that's what uh, excites me in Aswan, that we are but one. When I arrived at Hefield also, Malcolm Towers, said, all my patients are yours, and all your patients are mine. And say, hooray, <laughs> great. So we worked very well. Now it, this is happening, the cardiac team. And then what we have as well is the nurses training them more, and the, the engineers, and uh, the images, and the molecular biologists. Wow, so you guys have got it made. That's what I said, that the cardiac team is now complete. So that's the good. Did you want to know the bat? Yeah, please. Yeah. It's uh, over administration that they uh, do what I tell you. And all right, there are guidelines, but they are what they are, guidelines. There's not what I tell you, and if you don't do it, I'll sue you for negligence. Uh, this is dreadful. What I didn't like in the U.S. as well, the commercialism. That uh, patients, I used to work with uh, the students and uh, do the rupture the aorta in the middle of the night and say, but the patient comes back to our patient. In, in the U.K., they love you still. In the U.S., he said, doctor, I paid $20 to see you and you are 10 minutes late. I said, the, I had all the students who uh, worked all night with me. They are lovely. Again, proves my point. Young people, young blood, we have to do it. But the commercialism making, I bought your services. Mm. That's awful. That's bad for the patient, bad for you, because you want to be the champion of the patient because as they, I can't remember, I think it would, was Brock or somebody said, you can't be more confident than that. 
you become unconscious and leave somebody in charge of your body. So, but that's my responsibility. Oh my God, this is a massive responsibility. But to say it's commercial, you bought my services. Sorry, sir, you haven't. And that is why I adore the NHS. Yeah. It's the greatest system of healthcare delivery. And that's what I talked about, about the Aswan Heart Center as well. Yeah. Uh, but, but tell me more about that. What have you been able to change at the Aswan Heart Center? And how have you been able to do things differently and innovatively? Uh, I, uh, uh, with a group as well. Yeah. We have a, a very large group. Now there are 700 or 900. And they are first class administrators. We actually, initially, we didn't have very good administrators. Now they tell us everything. That one operation costs $9,000 all told. That is a switch operation which will cost here 100000 and in the States three times that. So cost effectiveness. So they tell us all these things. Uh, from the beginning, it was an extension of the idea of the chain of hope that there are three things. One, cardiac surgery and cardiac medicine at the highest level, free at entry, really doing the NHS thing, nobody pays anything, even if they are millionaires or billionaires. We have millionaires coming to our Ross operation, which we do, or a switch, and we don't send them a bill. So that's the built in training young people to carry on in the future and research. In the research, we have uh, several arms. We have molecular, we have imaging, we have population science, so we have a village nearby. So we follow them for the next 20 years. So we're having great fun, all uh, on donations. We convinced the, the population and the, the rich and poor again, that this venture belongs to them, which it does, of course. It doesn't belong to me, to you, or to anybody else. So they shower the center, especially during Ramadan now, where they send small donations, which add up to $30 million. So they own the center, and they run the center. But of course they don't run, they fund the center. And so that's the model of what. And then the net result, 1,000 open heart, a year, 3,000 interventions, all for free, 60% of the open heart are below one year, and 40% are below one month, the latest in everything. So it's greatest fun. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Great. And uh, finally, I know we've taken up a lot of your time, <coughs> a lot of your time for these young people with high energy who want to do something. What message would you give them if they're in their 20s or if they're in the early stage wanting to have impact, wanting to change something? What would you tell them? I think the three things I mentioned earlier, uh, that they have uh, to believe in what they're doing. They have to choose something they have a passion for. Uh, they have to be persistent and not go right, left, and up and down. And they should have humility. But the first step is realize what they want, and there are plenty of opportunities because of what we just have talked about, the multidisciplinary uh, nature of cardiology, cardiac surgery. But only any other branch now, you have a toolbox which is full of very effective things. So if you don't succeed, it's your fault exciting time like when you were told there's nothing left to do in cardiac surgery you know it still doesn't apply yeah great well thank you so much for giving up your time so generously really appreciate it no i certainly enjoyed it thank you thanks great um i don't know anything else you want to ask quickly whilst you don't think one thing what excites what excites the what's yeah. coming what's, what's coming in the future that really excites you 
Sure. So I just talked about it that with all the tools. Sure. Uh, but if you yeah. want to spell it out uh, about, uh, about what uh, precision medicine, uh, human genome project, yeah, I can talk about that if you want to. But I think it is obvious, and I touched on it, but I didn't go and the imaging, but precision medicine to actually give the appropriate uh, drug to everybody rather than uh, clinical trials. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They are necessary, but that's a very poor tool, actually. That's 60% or even 30% benefit. What about the 70% who do not benefit? Now you want to have 100% precision medicine. That's coming. Uh, gene editing rather than and regenerative therapy like yeah. I was just saying not stem cells stem cells have failed not exactly I'm, I'm exaggerating I'm a note because uh, the, uh, which type of stem cells you have to be specific of course so let's go if you want to talk about that I could but uh, stem cells, uh, embryonic stem cells, which were hailed to be save the world, didn't. Of course, it's unethical and a disaster. And that's totipotent cells. Uh, then bone, deri bone marrow-derived stem cells and fat-derived cells. Oh, disaster. Because people in different countries started, starting from Germany, I ask you, and the US, uh, big trials injecting stem cells in the coronaries for coronary disease and for heart failure and big failure. What is so regenerative medicine to get the ECM or the scaffold, whether it's biological or synthetic? Synthetic is better. We're using synthetic. And my God, it recruited your own cells including stem cell. So no rejection, uh, no immunosuppression, nothing. And it produces a beautiful, innervated organ. In this case, it's only a blood vessel we're starting, but it will come to the heart. Yeah. So that's tissue engineering Exciting. is paramount. Yeah. Great, and then there's one last thing I want to ask you, and that are you recording? Yeah. Yeah, we can edit it and everything uh, later yeah. on. Uh, a final thing is just going right back to the beginning, and you mentioned your father. Um, do you think he may have said that on purpose to you to try and motivate you and drive you to this, or do you think that's overthinking? I think I will never know. Is the honest answer. At that time, I thought he meant it, but it could well be that he wanted to push me in, the, in that direction. But to me, it sounded he meant it. But actually, it did the work. It worked out. It worked. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Are we within time, madam? I think you're fine, actually. Yeah, perfect. 11.30, 11.40. Yeah. Great. I mean, that was yeah, inspiring.